This episode will start differently than any other episode of the podcast. I will not introduce my guest, not only because if you are anywhere near marketing in the marketing world, you already know who he is, but also because of the fact that if you simply search his first name in Google, he'll most likely come up as the first result. So it is my absolute honor to welcome to the podcast, Seth Godin. Hi, Seth. Hey, how are you? I'm so glad you had me. Thanks. I'm glad you're here. Um, and, you know, tell me, Seth, um, you know, and I promise this will be the only question that is about you today. <laughs> but <laughs> aside from the tremendous amount of content from you and about you on the web, I want to know how does Seth Godin describe himself? Oh, uh, I'm a teacher. I've been a teacher since uh, 1977. And those are my best days. That's what I'm the best at. That's what when people ask me to do that, I, I can show up. I love it. You show up as a teacher. Well, you taught me I'm a student, so I can definitely say that that's Thank you. accomplished. Thank you. <laughs> so let's talk marketing a little bit. Um, so Seth, I, re I didn't realize that marketing was a thing until I realized that I wasn't good at selling. Um, even in my social life, I couldn't sell myself to girls with pickup lines but what I could do is I could present what I had to offer in a way that attracted engagement. I was too shy to make the first move, so I had to market myself enough for my prospects, so to speak, mm -hmm. to make their first move. So that's when the idea of what marketing was became clear to me. Um, but Seth, I believe that you have a bit of a different view of how to define marketing than most people. So tell us, how do you define it? And what are some of the flaws that others have in defining it? Well, actually, I sort of like your definition, which is so different than other people's. Most people think marketing is hype and hustle and advertising and promotion and getting the word out. It's a selfish activity based on the belief that if you could just interrupt enough people, you could make enough money to interrupt enough people. And that works if you're one of the only people who are doing it. And so we get ring around the collar or we get um, you know, all the TV commercials we grew up with that no one wanted to see, but we had to see them and they paid for themselves. But in the last 20 years, with the explosion of free media, with the ability of every individual to show up in front of other people, clearly scarce attention has been strip mined to the point where marketing in the old way doesn't make any sense. So I think modern marketing is the privilege, the chance to help people get to where they want to go. Not to steal their attention, but to earn their enrollment and the benefit of the doubt. And if we have people's enrollment, they want to go somewhere, and they are likely to trust us, then our job pretty clearly is to teach them, is to say, if you knew what I know, you would want to do this. And so what it means to become a marketer is to have a story, a true story, a story that holds up to scrutiny that other people want to hear. And that only makes sense if you are only serving a few people. It's impossible to be a mass brand anymore. That their salsa outsells ketchup, but it outsells ketchup because there's lots and lots and lots of kinds of salsa and only one kind of ketchup. <laughs> You're not going to be able to make something that everybody wants. So in terms of those everybody's that marketers are trying to find, you know, we're all trying to build these target audiences by using demographics, firmographics, even psychographics. So what are some of the ways that organizations might miss the mark when they're trying to do all this targeting? Well, first, I would say that targeting is a hunting term. And you're not a hunter, you're a farmer. And farmers have the choice of which field. They plant things, they fertilize them, they water them, and then they patiently wait for them to grow. And farmers don't use words like targeting. The opportunity that you have is to say, where is there fertile territory where I can add actual value? And I think demographics are an old-fashioned uh, method that is only used by people who don't understand psychographics. Demographics are, what do you look like and what's on your census form? Psychographics are, what do you believe? What do you want? What do you dream of? And if I know you drive a pickup truck, that is way more interesting to me than knowing that you are a 45-year-old woman. And um, we need to find the choices that people are already choosing to make and then helping their dreams come true. 
is it because of later or recent technology that allows us to dig deeper into psychographics versus just, you know, 20 years ago's demographics? Yeah, we, everyone leaves a trail now. And, you know, you don't have to see someone online to see their trail. I can tell your trail from your garage. I can tell your trail from your bumper stickers. I can tell your trail from uh, how you sit in a restaurant and how big a tip you live, leave, right? But online, that is getting more and more filled in. The challenge is doing it with permission, not by spying on people. Speaking of permission, I was away for a few days. My wife realized that her commercials had changed. She had logged out of our, I won't say brand name account, and logged into the wrong account. All of a sudden, her commercials were all different. And the interesting thing was it bothered her because she had grown accustomed to targeted, I guess there's that word, accustomed to the right commercials for her. Yeah. And all of a sudden, she realized, you know what? I'd rather see ones that do target me than ones that don't. Yeah, no, we train people. If When I go into a bookstore now, it's very frustrating because they don't reorganize the whole store around me. <laughs> and that was the deal that Amazon made, is you let us spy on you, and in return, we will make it that you want us to spy on you. And where it breaks down is when someone didn't make that offer. That mm. if you're credit card company called you on the phone and they said, hey, Lee, we noticed you're staying in a lot of hourly motels, buying things in strip clubs, blah, blah, blah. Here's a free coupon for free STD testing. You'd be really annoyed because <laughs> you didn't sign up for that. The fact is they do, I'm not in your case, but they do know that about people. You just don't want them to act like they do. Yeah. And so where we are as marketers is the more clarity there is about what the offer is, the more confidence you can have as to whether you have permission or not, right? Is it okay if we do this and this and this, and then you'll get that and that? This is totally different than the stupid cookie warning that came out of Europe. Nobody reads the cookie warning. The cookie warning has negative value because people are now sneaking stuff into it that we don't want to agree to. They would be, we would be better off if they just got rid of it. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is I made a mistake on my blog yesterday. I got the time zone. I, I put it that it should go out at 6 p.m. instead of 6 a.m. And at 6.15, more than one person had emailed me saying, where's your blog today? That's what you want to have happen. That's a real indicator of the quality and the demand for your content. No, it's an indication of the promise. And there's, that's it's the difference, to- right? Like the deal is, my blog isn't going to be perfect tomorrow, but it'll be here. And that's the only reason to subscribe to it is I told you, like when the newspaper doesn't come, I get an email from the company saying, yeah, there's bad weather. You're not going to get your paper because I went out this morning looking for it. That's what you want. Your wife wants the ads for her. Okay. Got you. Hmm. I'm glad you, I love, I love when I ask a question and get a strong disagreement because if I don't get that, it's not a very good interview. Sorry, I didn't mean to be disrespectful. <laughs> no, 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 really. I, I don't want to talk someone, talk to someone who totally agrees with me or to, doesn't even add to it. Otherwise, either they're not listening or I or my listeners don't learn anything. So <laughs> that, that's great. I love that. So I want to get into some of the things you've, you've said and written. I've got a few of books around. And you know, speaking of uh, how Amazon can definitely... Um, show you what you want. I don't ever miss any of your books because when I log on and they know my preference of what I like to read and listen to, typically a Seth book will pop up if it's, there's a new one. Um, so I want to ask you, being someone who has written so many books and is held in such high regard by many people, I want to understand your thoughts behind coming up with a, a concept or an idea and then st- standing behind the idea until it's one that your peers begin to quote and people begin to write about. Yeah, so I had a big insight about three months after the book Purple Cow came out. I got an email from a guy, and he said, I want to tell you a story. Uh, I work at a matrix organization, which means I have two bosses, which is really annoying. He said, one boss said to me, uh, everyone in the company is getting behind this Purple Cow thing. You better get up to speed on it. And so the guy like looked around on Yahoo, whatever, found the book, bought the book, read the book. And then he said to his other boss, uh, I just read Purple Cow. It's a great book. And his other boss said, there's a book? 
That's what I want. I want not to be associated with the idea that email marketing is now a $12 billion a year plus industry. MailChimp sold for more than $10 billion. I got zero. I got zero, which is fine because I didn't write permission marketing so that I would get a check from the folks at MailChimp. I wrote it because I wanted to shine a light on an idea. And that's what my best blog posts do. That's what my best books do. I intentionally write them so people will steal my ideas and not give me credit. So how do you gain such confidence in, in your own thoughts that you're able to deliver those thoughts as something that is worth becoming quotable? So almost no one's ever asked me that. And the deal is pilots need to have confidence. Because one thing you may notice is that even though technically they could make pilotless planes where the person who's flying it is sitting in Dallas, they don't. Because the passengers want to know the pilot has skin in the game. But in my case, I am regularly saying, don't take my word for it. Just do the work. Do the math that I did. Look up what I looked up and see if you come to the same conclusion I did. And I'm still doing that. I have zero confidence that I am right about. All. If, if someone comes back to me and says, we did everything you said and it didn't work, I go, oh, that's interesting. Not, oh, I can't believe it. I'm so embarrassed because I don't know. I'm just shining lights here. I'm not telling people exactly what to do. So I asked you that question because I know a lot of people who are either leaders in the organization or authors or thought leaders or speakers, sometimes they hold back out of fear that they might be wrong or disagree with. But does that just, that just comes with the territory, right? Yeah. I, you know, if I was a ditch digger, I would get tired every day. That's my job. Well, my job is to engage in emotional labor, to take intellectual risks, to say things with confidence that I can't prove. That's what I do. And I don't think it would make sense for me to whine about that because it's what I signed up for. You said a word that really strikes me is the word prove. Because so often we get hung up with things that we strongly believe in and we have experience and evidence of in our minds and our experiences and we have to believe in them without the proof. Yeah. And that's what faith is for me anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just bought this really cool product on Amazon. It's called, I can't remember exactly the name. It rhymes with placebo. It's just a, a, a little container of sugar pills that are labeled as placebos. <laughs> and there is science that has been done to prove that even when you tell someone they are taking a placebo, their back pain will go away because that's how our brains work. And, you know, there's the famous story of Galileo dropping the two balls off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And he proved beyond any doubt that heavy balls and light balls fall at the same rate. And after he did it, they still taught the opposite at the university. When uh, Semmelweis proved that women were dying in childbirth because doctors didn't wash their hands, it took 20 years before doctors started washing their hands. And if we move forward to the 1960s, they proved that bacteria causes a lot of ulcers and doctors didn't start doing anything about it for 20 years. People believe things and proof is totally different, right? And what we do as marketers is we better start from a place that's resilient, that holds up to scrutiny. But then we tell a story. And that story could involve being published in a peer-reviewed journal, but it could just as easily involve having the right typeface on our billboard because it's a story. And if people believe the story, they will find facts. But if they don't believe the story, they will ignore facts. And so when you've got an idiot on the floor of the Senate throwing a snowball saying that that's proof that climate change isn't real. Well, two minutes of research would have indicated that that makes absolutely no sense. But <laughs> it was a really good story. And we're talking about it 20 years later because intuitively it doesn't make sense that it's snowing in Texas and we have global warming. Of course, they make sense if you do the research, but the story sticks with us. So what I propose to people is first, make sure the thing you're selling actually makes back pain go away. Make sure that the work you're doing actually is something you would pick if you knew what you know. And then tell a story about it that resonates 
with your audience, the smallest viable audience, not with everyone, but with mm-hmm. your people. And I'll finish my rant by saying I got my start making uh, computer games with uh, Ray Bradbury and Arthur C. Clarke and Michael Crichton. But I also licensed a bunch of video games from the UK. And in those days, video games were on cassette tape and they were not very good compared to today, but they were the best you could get. And so I had this Kung Fu fighting game, 1983. And so what's the story I'm going to tell? So there's a big circle on the front that says, the most violent computer game ever made. Because <laughs> if that's what you're looking for, here it is. That was a promise. <laughs> well, I'm glad you went, went to that, to the, to the games, because something I read in one of your books recently, uh, I won't try the name which one, um, but um, I'm in the middle of the practice right now, so maybe it was in there. Or it could have been um, what to do when it's your turn. But it was about creativity. So I want to get your advice on something that I think you've, that I know you've written about. Um, once upon a time, my mother asked me, Lee, when, when are you going to give up this creative phase? <laughs> my response to her was, Mom, I will always be an artist, but I promise you I will not ever be a starving artist. So lucky for me, I was able to build a growing business around what I love, which is creating media. However, I still have one foot planted firmly and safely in the corporate as an employee. So what do you say to creative people who may be holding back on their full potential because they are taking the safer route? So what does it even mean to be a creative person? I think that's different than saying, I have interesting hobbies. Uh, I think that what it means to be a creative person is that you are seeking to, with generosity, solve interesting problems. What makes a problem interesting is it hasn't been solved yet. And that could be, how do I put something on this two foot by four foot canvas that moves somebody to tears. It could be, how do I fill this podcast with enough information that they're glad they listened to it? Or it could be, how do I design a number five stainless steel screw so it will fit easily into this device I'm building without rusting, right? So there's a range of interesting problems, but we're always doing them with generosity. And the alternative is either to be a selfish hustler which is no one who's listening to this, or to be a compliant cog in the system where someone tells you what to do. So if you are creative and solving interesting problems and you work at McDonald's, you're going to get fired because they don't want you to fry the fries in a creative way. They want you to fry the fries the correct way. So that's a job opportunity if that's what you want to do. But your question is, how can you be safe or can you walk away from safe? And my argument is because we live in revolutionary times, the single safest thing you can do is be creative. Because if you can consistently and regularly solve interesting problems, you will never worry about getting a job. And, you know, the example I give is in the 70s or 80s, on one day, the Ford Motor Company laid off 10,000 workers on the Ford Explorer assembly line, 10,000. Those people didn't get fired because they were taking risks, because they were being creative. They got fired because they were doing what they were told. The people who screwed up were the people who designed the latest Ford Explorer. Because if they had actually leaned in and made it a good car, they wouldn't have lost their jobs. So what that tells me is that the UAW, when they saw how bad the Explorer was, should have gone on strike and said, we're not coming back to work until you make a better car. But number two is if you're one of those people on the assembly line, this is a really good chance for you to say, where are there interesting problems I can solve? Because that's a safe way to support my family. So in terms of delivering that creativity, one of the ideas in your book, the practice is we become creative when we ship the work. Um, and this reminds me of many of my music industry friends, music producer friends that I have who have catalogs and catalogs of music that no one's ever heard. Even artists, visual artists you mentioned who, who have art that no one's ever seen. They hold back because either they don't think it's good enough or they're worried about someone stealing it. And my view is that their creativity has zero value until someone experiences it. So um, is there anything like this? Is this what this idea is about, about shipping your your work? Exactly. So uh, if you're solving an interesting problem, it's not creative if you didn't solve the problem. If no one sees your painting, then you didn't touch anyone. So you didn't do anything. And... uh, I tell the story of Hilma Af Klimt, 
who was a painter who did really important work for 25 years. She painted thousands of paintings that no one saw until 20 years after her death. And so she was a painter, but she wasn't an artist. Because in order to be an artist, you need to put yourself on the hook and put the work in front of someone. And then from a practical point of view, uh, what a cheap way to learn. Because the person who's just putting those songs on their hard drive isn't getting any better because they don't know what works and what mm. doesn't. And I was looking back at you know the first 20 blog posts out of my 7,000. A lot of them weren't very good. It took to, I think, blog post 40 before I sounded like me. And I only sounded like me because I changed what I sounded like because I learned from the people who were engaging with what I was doing. And I can repeat that process on every project I've ever worked on. Until it interacts with the world, I'm just humoring myself. Until it interacts with the world, you're just humoring yourself. I love that. <laughs> That's a quotable. I'm going to use that for the next producer who I see a hard drive full of music and no one's he heard it yet. So, you know, that makes me think that, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. My father was also a serial entrepreneur. And on his deathbed, he told me that he regretted not sticking with the very first business that he had originally started. So for me, the past six years, I've been working on doing fewer and fewer different things. Not less work, but fewer kinds of work. And I realized six years ago that I cannot afford to do everything that I'm good at, let alone things that I'm mediocre at, and certainly not things that, I'm not, that aren't backed with intention. So with that, I was able to stick with and grow a business that is stronger than any of my previous businesses. So I want to get your take on, what can you share with us about the impact of focus and intention? Wow. Yeah. I'm sure your father was really proud of you. And I'm, I'm sorry he left so early. Um, he had a point, which is that there's a dip in front of all of us. And there are two parts to this dip. One, the story we tell ourselves inside, which is, oh, well, I'll just go on to the next thing. And this ability to flit from one thing to another. That's a series of hobbies. I'm in favor of hobbies, but you are not fairly rewarded, nor are you refining your skill if you are flip, flitting around too much. But the second thing is that the market rewards people that are seen as having paid their dues, seen as having gone to the other side of the dip, seen as being the best at what they do. And you know, I can tell you that people give me way more of the benefit of the doubt than they did 20 years ago. My ideas aren't that much better than they were 20 years ago. But because I've stuck it out and because I've earned at some level a little bit more trust, I get more leverage. And so the combination of the two, more skill and more trust, makes it that your work is going to be more handsomely rewarded. Skill plus trust yeah. equals reward or leads to reward. Okay. So bringing this back to marketing a little bit. Um, I love that we talked about the art of it and the creativity of it. And I love that marketing gets into, as a marketer, I get to venture into the art as much as the science part of it. So I want to talk about the art part, more specifically the creative ideas. Um, because Seth, I've got a love-hate relationship with analysts. And I've, I've mentioned this many times before. It's that it isn't that their information isn't necessary or that it's not valuable, but because it's based on history, in my opinion. And I feel like its usefulness has its limits. So do you think any groundbreaking ideas or leaps in business growth ever come from analyzing what has already happened? Um, first, I want to thank you for these questions. These are some of the best questions. <laughs> what a great conversation. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. I will so. also say we've been talking about marketing the whole time. That what yeah. we haven't been talking about is hype and promo and advertising, but we've been talking about marketing the whole time. And you know, I did an interview a bunch of years ago with the fashion designer, Diane von Furstenberg. And um, American Express has hired me to do a series of interviews. I'm not as good at it as you, so I was really working hard to practice it. And I was out of my element talking to her, so I read both of her autobiographies. And I'm digging deep and she's not helping me. And finally, I roll out my best question, which was... Uh, she had had a chapter in one of her books about the difference between cosmetics and fragrances because 
if you approach them differently, you can really come out ahead. And the purpose of the interview was to help small businesses. So I said, talk a little bit about the difference between uh, cosmetics and fragrances and how that uh, thinking really helped you. And her answer was, it made it clear she had not only not written her autobiography, she hadn't read her autobiography. (laughs) And so the thing is, she was intuitive. She just Mm. did, quote, what felt right. But the reason that she was so successful for so long was she was living in the industry. She was not analyzing with words, but she understood the genre. She understood what people she was serving wanted before they knew what they wanted. So her, her immersion in the history gave her the ability to predict and create the future. But she had no words to describe it because that part of her brain just didn't function properly. And the challenge that we have when we talk to analysts or do focus groups is we're looking for proof and deniability so that we can say, oh, Look at this pie chart. Look at this chart. Therefore, I'm off the hook if we do this. But breakthroughs never have proof and deniability because if they did, someone would have done it before you got there. So what I think we need to do is do the reading, know the territory, make sure we've been here before. Imagine with empathy the people we seek to serve, right? That Phil Knight and the leadership at, at Nike didn't have a great reputation for how they treated other people, nor a great reputation for for business analysis. But they deeply understood what it was like to be Roger Bannister. And they deeply understood what it was like to be a competitor who will, you know, throw a foul with 10 seconds left to go in the game because that's how they're going to win. And that understanding of who they were there to serve, call that analysis if you want. But that's why I could never be in the sneaker business because I don't care about those people one bit. And that ability to do both, to be aware of the data, be aware of what the analyst said, and then be able to go do something that other people think isn't going to work, that's what we're going for. That's the difference. So you, you said the word serve a moment ago. So I think it's a good place for us to, I want to ask you the last question and, and respect your time. Um, Speaking of new new ideas and making change, Seth, your Akimbo podcast is in its eighth season. Congratulations for that. Um, you're best known for being a writer and a speaker, though. So why podcasting? And what is your intention, as we mentioned earlier, behind the Akimbo podcast? What a good question. When people ask me that question, I wonder if I should just stop podcasting because I don't know the answer. <laughs> um well, you're teaching, I've, so I've I can on, give you that much. I've been on the edge of media longer than most. As I told you before we started, I was on the internet in 1976. My customers used to be AOL and CompuServe. I used to work at Yahoo. I've been in DVDs. Whenever a new form of media shows up, uh, I'm sort of interested in it. And I saw podcasting coming a very long time ago. I did a podcast um, called Startup School that's still super popular. I recorded it all in one weekend. Um, and So I thought a lot about if I was going to do a podcast, what would be the dynamics of it? And when a potential partner showed up and said, you're thinking of a podcast, we'll pay for you to get started. I was like, well, now or never. Stop bluffing. You should do it or not. But since those first 20 episodes, I'm now up to more than 200. I don't get paid. I don't have advertisers. I just like this medium in the sense that when I, I just turn the shower over there into a soundproof room and go in by myself and record. Um, sometimes I want to do three in a week and sometimes I don't, but I feel like I am building a body of work that I am proud of. And from what I hear from the people who listen, they're grateful for the form of teaching I am doing. Um, if the podcast went away tomorrow, I would miss my producer a great deal, but I would probably get over the rest of it. And so as long as I'm doing it, I'll do it. And the minute I don't feel like I'm using my listeners' time well, I'll stop. Well, it's definitely appreciated. I, I want to thank you personally because I think of all your books that I've consumed, um, they've been mostly audio. Um, I, I, and what I actually do, I'll listen to a book. If I like it, I'll go purchase the hard copy just to support and put it on my bookshelf. 
Um, but yeah, I've listened to most of yours and I'm, I'm happy about the podcast because that's how I choose to consume content is listening. And so while I can't take the book on the treadmill as easily, I can definitely listen to the podcast or a book. So Love that. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. I appreciate it. So before we go, Seth, you know, again, I'm, I'm tremendously grateful for your time and your insights today. Um, you said on our emails earlier that you didn't want to promote anything, but please tell us about your most recent book. Uh, so you mentioned the practice. Uh, that is a book about shipping creative work. The book before that is sort of my seminal book on marketing called This Is Marketing. I wrote it so that someone who's listening to this podcast would have everything I have to say about marketing in one place. I don't think I've ever read a book about marketing that's like that. Um, and I'm working on an all-volunteer project right now that we're going to announce in a few weeks. Uh, but it's completely different than everything else I've ever done. I'm working on it with 300 other people in 36 countries, and it's thrilling. Great, great. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Seth. I really appreciate you joining me. Thank you. Really a pleasure. And thank you. Stay well. And thanks to our listeners. If you're listening to the podcast and want to also see Seth and I, video the podcast and others will be available uh, in the podcast section of contentmonster.com. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to the Business of Marketing podcast, a show brought to you by ContentMonster.com, the producer of B2B digital marketing content. Show notes can be found on ContentMonster.com as well as aleejudge.com. To continue the conversation, be sure to follow the podcast on your favorite podcast platform.